Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in God's word today. I pray that it is a blessing for all of us as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We begin today by reading a portion of Psalm 148. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. We continue to read Jeremiah's prophecy and hear from him continued encouragement and messages of hope for the God's faithful people who were living among the rebellious people of Judah. We're going to hear God say, talk about the judgment that will come, but also tell his people that he will bring healing and restoration after the judgment. While he was still confined in the guard's courtyard, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time. The Lord who made the earth, the Lord who forms it to establish it, the Lord is his name, says this, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and incomprehensible things you do not know. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the houses of this city and the palaces of Judah's kings, the ones torn down now for defense against the assault ramps and the sword. The people coming to fight the Chaldeans will fill the houses with the corpses of their own men that I strike down in my wrath and fury. I have hidden my face from this city because of all their evil. Yet I will certainly bring health and healing to it and will indeed heal them. I will let them experience the abundance of true peace. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and of Israel and will rebuild them as in former times. I will purify them from all the iniquity they have committed against me, and I will forgive all the iniquities they have committed against me, rebelling against me. This city will bear on my behalf a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, who will hear of all the prosperity I will give them. They will tremble with awe because of all the good and all the peace I will bring about for them. This is what the Lord says. In this place, which you say is a ruin without people or animals, that is, in Judah's cities and Jerusalem's streets that are a desolation without people, without inhabitants, and without animals, there will be heard again a sound of joy and gladness, the voice of the groom and the bride, and the voice of those saying, Give thanks to the Lord of armies, for the Lord is good. His faithful love endures forever as they bring thanksgiving sacrifices to the temple of the Lord. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as in former times, says the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies says. In this desolate place, without people or animals, and in all its cities, there will once more be a grazing land where shepherds may rest flocks. The flocks will again pass under the hands of the one who counts them in the cities of the hill country, the cities of the Judean foothills, the cities of the Negev, the land of Benjamin, the areas around Jerusalem, and in Judah's cities, says the Lord. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will fulfill the good promise that I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up for David, and he will administer justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name, and this is what she will be named. The Lord is our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel. The, the Levitical priests will never fail to have a man always before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night cease to come at their regular time, 
then also my covenant with my servant David may be broken. If that could happen, then he would not have a son reigning on his throne, and the Levitical priests would not be my ministers. Even as the stars of heaven cannot be counted, and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so too I will make innumerable the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who minister to me. Jesus is now standing before the governor Pontius Pilate. And in our New Testament reading for today, we are going to hear Matthew's account of Jesus' trial before Pilate. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus answered, you say so. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how much they are testifying against you? But he didn't answer him on even one charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? for he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. Our writing for today comes from the pen of C.F.W. Walther, and he here comments on the crucifixion of Jesus. The crucifixion, which ended with the triumphant cry, it is finished, was the offering of the all-sufficient sacrifice for the atonement of all sinners. The man on the cross was the Lamb of God, who bears the sins of the world to carry them away from the face of God. The salvation of the whole world once hung by those three nails of the cross on Golgotha. As the fruit from the wood of the forbidden tree from which the first man once ate brought sin, death, and damnation upon the entire human race, so the fruits of the wood of the cross restored righteousness, life, and blessedness to all people. On account of this, the cross is both holy and blessed. Once nothing but a dry piece of wood, it was changed, like Aaron's staff, into a green branch full of heavenly blossoms and fruit. Once an instrument of torment for the punishment of sinners, it now shines in heavenly splendor for all sinners as a sign of grace. Once the wood of the curse, it has now become, after the promised blessing for all people offered himself upon it, a tree of blessing, an altar of sacrifice for the atonement, and a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Today, the cross is still a terror, but only to hell. It shines upon its ruins as a sign of the victory over sin, death, and Satan. With a crushed head, the serpent of temptation lies at the foot of the cross, 
It is a picture of eternal comfort upon which the dimming eye of the dying longingly looks, the last anchor of his hope, and the only light that shines in the darkness of death. Our hymn today is a stanza from the Lenten hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by man rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. Proofs I see sufficient of it. Tis the true and faithful word. And we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as the healer of nations, you released many from their bondage to sin, death, and the devil. But when it came time to release you, the crowd chose a murderer instead. Through our co-crucifixion with you in the waters of our baptism, may we continually be released from our sins as we confess you to be our everlasting King. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. What a pleasure it has been to spend this time in God's word with you today. God richly bless your day. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.